So in early 1672, um, Newton sent to London to the Secretary of the Royal Society, Henry Oldenburg, an account of his new theory of light and colour, which detailed a selection of his experiments with prisms and lenses, and as he judged, showed the absolute truth of the doctrine of light and colour which he presented. That is to say, it's not just that he reckoned that he demonstrated that light, white light, is made of seven different colour-making rays, um, that each of these rays is primitive in the sense that it can't be changed by any further refraction, and that this model explains all the phenomena of light and colour presented in his essay, but that this was done with certainty, with the kind of certainty which Newton associated with the Euclidean geometry, that it had been demonstrated. And for Newton, demonstration is the highest form of knowledge. Um, and it's equivalent to geometrical demonstration from certain undeniable premises, certain undeniable conclusions have flowed. That, however, was not the official stance of the Royal Society. And in particular, it was not the official stance of the Royal Society's chief experimenter, Robert Hooke. So within a few weeks, in effect, Hooke had set out to copy the experiments Newton described. Most of them, he was able to see the results that Newton had seen. But as Hooke almost immediately pointed out in 1672, um, a quite different explanation of these phenomena was available. This would be an explanation based on pulses and vibrations in some kind of fluid and ether. Um, this would be an explanation which supposed that um, white light was made up of a combination not of seven different colour-making rays, but of some kind of superposition of vibrations of uh, light and dark. There was no reason, Hooke said, to be forced to accept what Hooke called Newton's hypothesis. So from then on, both in exchanges with Hooke and right through till 1676, in exchanges with, for example, a group of Jesuit scholars, uh, English Jesuit scholars based at the College at Liège, in the Low Countries, Newton found himself increasingly embroiled under Oldenburg's management in a series of letters, debates, exchanges, instructions and controversies that drag him further and further into trying to spell out, first of all, how to do the experiments that Newton described, secondly, how to see that they were demonstrative, and therefore, thirdly, why everyone must accept that Newton's account of light and colour was not a hypothesis, but certain truth. Um, eventually, and notoriously, Newton breaks off this set of debates and uh, more or less decides by 1676, 1677 to have nothing further to do with the international community of experimental philosophy, not to engage in any further debate, and indeed to withdraw, as he puts it, from philosophy entirely. Now, there's a, uh, there's a long tradition in uh, biography that sees this as but one aspect of Newton's dogmatic, opinionated, self-obsessed psychology. Um, why could he not see that debate was the stuff of the sciences. Um, why was he so certain and dogmatic about his claims? I think that story systematically underestimates what's at stake in these exchanges. I mean, there clearly may be, or perhaps must be, a psychological, personal aspect to this. But dogmatic dispute in the second half of the 1600s in Northwest Europe is not exclusively a property of Isaac Newton. This is a remarkably polemical, ferocious, violent and vicious period 
in the history of the sciences and Newton is, to put it mildly, not alone in the violence with which disputes are sustained, the confidence with which views are put forward and the sudden, perhaps in our eyes, petulant decision either to withdraw or attack. Rather, I think what one has to do is to see the ways in which different standards of evidence and proof and different philosophical terminology is in play here. Um, in Newton's case, his model of light and colour is a mathematical model. It's based on um, measures of the angles through which light rays move. It rather strenuously refuses, at least initially, to offer an underlying material account of what light and colour really are. So from Newton's point of view, his letter of February 1672 is extremely uh, modest and limited and economical in that all it does is to set out a series of phenomena artificially made as most of them are and from those uh, deduce consequences which are undeniable. Um, so not a hypothesis but a series of deductions from what everyone must see. Um, so there's a close relationship between the certitude Newton reckoned was proper to the inferences he was making in that letter and the fact that the method he was using was a mixture of mathematics and experiment, was, mi was mixed mathematics. Um, so there's a relationship in a certain sense between the passion with which his conclusions are held and the status of the method he reckoned he was using. Um, and in that sense, I think a, a purely psychotraumatic reading of this exchange makes two big errors. It neglects the standards of the time completely and it neglects the specifics of what it was that Newton was arguing for and the fact that for uh, scholastic Jesuits like uh, Newton's opponents in Liège or mechanical experimental philosophers like Robert Hooke in London, they were living by completely different standards. And that became more and more clear during the middle of the 1670s. So I think those disputes have a great deal to tell us about the heterogeneity of the cultures of experiment and mixed mathematics in play in Northwest Europe at this period.